uh, good evening and uh, hello everybody. Do you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, it's very difficult uh, with the uh, screen. And I came to the subject of this paper uh, after I had a problem translating the syntax can of uh, senses that Charles Sanders Peirce uh, used when he was uh, writing an elaborate uh, critic of, of a book uh, describing a series of cases of telepathic uh, hallucination, Phantasms of uh, the Living, collection edited by Gurney, Myers and Podmore. I tried to find out its meaning, of course, in my case for translation into Romanian. And thus I came to different uh, interpretation and explanation from dictionaries and uh, other contexts. A comprehensive uh, picture was provided to me by the Merriam Webster Dictionary, where there are two inputs for defining can. Uh, the definition of the NT1 is uh, the range of perception or understanding or knowledge abstract words that are beyond uh, the ken of young uh, children. And uh, NT2 A is uh, the range of vision and B sight uh, or uh, view. Definition of ken uh, as verb is uh, as a transitive verb, archaic C, and uh, chiefly dialectical recognize, chiefly Scotland know, and uh, intransitive verb, uh, chiefly Scotland uh, uh, also know. Miriam uh, Dictionary uh, offer uh, also uh, a short history for understanding uh, can. The nan, uh, the can as nan is uh, mean is in hundred one hundred one thousand five hundred and ninety, in the meaning defined by sense two a the range of vision and as verb in the thirteenth century, in the meaning defined the transitive uh, verb. For uh, the Etymology for can in Middle uh, English is canon from Old English uh, canon. Uh, another uh, right uh, this uh, word. Uh, also in Danish kend uh, or Swedish kana or Old Norse Norwegian is kena, but uh, akin to Old English can and uh, no. We can see more. Uh, at can entry in uh, the more dictionary. Uh, as verb, uh, can appeared in uh, English horizon more and more in the 16th century as a term of measurement of the distance bounding the range of ordinary vision at sea, about uh, 20 uh, miles. British author uh, John Lilly uh, used that sense when he wrote, uh, uh, for example, they are sadly come within a can of double. Other in the uh, 16th century, writers used can to mean a range of vision. For example, uh, Thomas Nash wrote, uh, uh, out of can we were air, the contents uh, came from the fest, or sight by Shakespeare is double debt uh, to drown in can of shore from uh, rape of Lucrece. Today, however, can uh, rarely suggest uh, literary sight. Rather, can uh, nowadays almost always implies a range of uh, perception, understanding and uh, knowledge. Uh, uh, this uh, on internet, uh, more uh, recent example on the web, which uh, does not represent the opinion of, of a dictionary or uh, Miriam dictionary. 
in English uh, Romanian dictionary, can is, uh, is translated uh, as an un horizon or sphere of knowledge in the expression beyond can, outside can, uh, not within one's can, or uh, Scottish transitive uh, verb uh, to know. I also looked uh, for other uh, places in the history of philosophy where the syntagm can of senses appears. The most significant uh, seemed to me for our case, one, uh, the one encountered in a translation of the poem De Rerum Natura by Titus Lucretius Carus, the translation of uh, William Ellery Leonard. Uh, this translation is uh, available on uh, Internet Archive. Uh, here uh, is a phrase uh, we for our interest is uh, for far Bennett, the can of senses lies the nature of those ultimates of the world. Uh, in other words, uh, after dealing with a Romanian translation, the can of sense is here. Uh, uh, similar to the intelligence of the sense or similar to it, uh, this uh, interpretation. The can of senses uh, in this translation is an exception because uh, it has no correspondent in Latin hic et nunc in this place uh, of poem. The phrase in Latin is omnis enim longe nostris ab sensibus infra primorum natura iacit. Uh, which in another translation may be simpler without capturing the spirit of the text. Uh, uh, for example, for the nature of the first things lies all hidden far beneath our senses. The translation of uh, rules in English, uh, the point of uh, Lucretius. I have brought into question the translation of the poem because in also uh, it is also related to Percy's interest in Lucretius' work, although he writes in uh, his manuscripts. I never read Lucretius. Of course, I have read parts, but uh, I never felt like undertaking a real study such as I hope to make. It is one of my great desiderata. Uh, Peirce probably never read uh, Lucretius seriously, but he probably felt the spirit of his uh, work capturing in Leonard's uh, translation. In the same article in which Peirce uh, comments on Phantasm of the Living and, uh, uh, and mention uh, the Sintang Ken of Senses, he introduced uh, one of his uh, specific terms, uh, percipum, which characterize one uh, of the aspects of uh, perception. Here too, he de developed uh, his conception of perception and uh, judgment or perceptual judgment using another uh, terms, ponecipum, ponecept, antecipium, Paying attention uh, to the way in which uh, Peirce tries to explain these terms that uh, have remained largely obscure to this day, and the extremely interesting uh, meaning of the term can and uh, the syntax can of senses, have led me to hypothesis, uh, hypothesis to that Peirce arrived at his uh, theory of uh, perception starting or being uh, the little stimulated by the openness offered by the term uh, can. As is the term can in the perception of which persons speak, uh, with all the stage definite by antecipium, ponecipium, ponecepta, percipium, which led uh, to the formation of judgment, we have involved an horizontal of knowledge a genuine intelligence uh, that leads uh, to reason. Like Lucretius, Peirce uh, speak of an intelligence of uh, the senses through the belief in the existence of a continuity 
uh, between perception, perception and uh, judgment, both under the wing uh, of the sign. In Perth, uh, both perception and judgment can be analyzed, analyzed uh, semiotically. But uh, Perth establish a connection of continuity between perception and judgment, not only genet uh, genetically, uh, see Ken's uh, explanation by reference to the, the uh, build of intelligence uh, in children, also studied by Piaget, but also conceptually. In Perth, uh, both perception and judgment presuppose relation, orientation, and meaning that uh, is a sign. Hence, the possibility of conceptual analysis of the perception through distinction such uh, as uh, antecipium, ponecipium, ponecep, percipum. In Perth, uh, shortly, uh, perception presupposes an intelligence reason uh, or reason that is beyond us and brings us to the threshold uh, of our own reason or intelligence. Thank you. Thank you very much for the talk, Titus. It was nice to hear you. You were uh, unlike in many academic uh, talks, particularly brief and to the point. Uh, do we have any questions for Titus? Any, any questions in the... Uh, I, I have a question <laughs> with the special uh, participation of my son here near me. Um, uh, can I ask the question? Yes, please, Jarrod, go ahead. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, uh, I, have a, I have a question. I mean, um, I know not so much about this, this epoch and this, this uh, inquiry that Peirce did. I know that that much that he did uh, uh, sort of a, a, um, a report on this work on, on Edmund Gurney, and he criticized heavily the work because it didn't, it didn't, it didn't, sorry, it didn't, uh, didn't, uh, Peirce uh, thought not the subject was awkward, but the methodology that Gurney used was awkward or it was a, a little bit off. I was uh, uh, I was wondering uh, if you have more information about what Peirce would consider, for instance, like uh, telepath uh, telepathy, uh, spiritualism, and other stuff like this. I know that Peirce uh, used some uh, asked some questions in the sense like whether or not this is possible, whether or not there is the possibility to know about this. But I would be interested in, in knowing a little bit more this brushing off with the with the, so to speak, the occult. But uh, I know that uh, in the sense uh, uh, it can it can uh, be uh, can have render some interesting hypothesis for the scientific in inquiry as well. Yes. Uh... I propose just uh, an, uh, uh, a suggestion for uh, interpretation uh, and uh, analyze the uh, percipium, clarify the, uh, the conception of purse on uh, percept or uh, perceptual judgment and uh, not uh, her view on uh, hallucination or uh, in uh, this, uh, this uh, telepathic. Uh, knowledge or the possibility of, uh, of uh, remember this uh, phenomenon and uh, uh, remember as uh, uh, knowledge or uh, uh, practice in, uh, in, uh, in uh, everyday uh, uh, experience. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thanks, any other questions for Titus? Last call, we still have a couple of minutes. All right, well, if there are no questions, thank you very much for the talk, Titus. Uh, thank you, and uh, the image is... <laughs>
Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry about the technical problem. <laughs> yes, I sorry. Know why you see the slides. And uh, next, the next talk is by Michele Ceduti. So Michele, you should be able to uh, share the share your screen. Would you like to share some slides? Yes. Thank you. I was about to ask you, in fact. So thank you very much. Okay. And please, when you're ready. Do you see the slides? Yes, we can see them well. Okay. Let me see just if I can. Okay, it was fair enough. So thank you very much and thanks for having me. Um, it's, uh, I would like uh, to start by confessing that it is my very, very first time that I present something to an audience. So um, a bit nervous, but also uh, very honored, honored to, be, to be here. So um, the title of my presentation is Diagrams as Centerpiece of an Activist Epistemology. Um, as you may have guessed already, uh, I'm inspired by um, an important uh, paper by Frederick Sternfeld called Diagrams as Centerpiece um, for a Persian Epistemology. And as you will see, um, I will make a lot of reference to Sternfeld, and, but on the other hand, I'm not the only one in the literature when it comes to um, semiotics and cognitive science. And also before starting, let me uh, give you a little premise since uh, I will be talking about diagrams and, uh, um, and activism. And since it is not obvious that the two things can stay together, um, I would like to start with this uh, kind of famous uh, argument by Thomas D'Adesio from his book called On Minds and Symbols from 1995, which, which was re really one of the, the, the first attempts to establish the cognitive semiotics enterpri enterprise, uh, uh, let's say, along with uh, um, maybe Umberto Eco's book, Kant and the Platypus from 97. And so um, his idea was that what he called uh, pure semiotics uh, uh, before 95, obviously, was uh, um, uh, anti-mentalistic and, uh, uh, and reductionist. So for example, here the argument uh, uh, goes as follows. Um, epistemologies like Percy's and Morris's, for example, are reductionistic, reductionistic I'm sorry in the sense that they try to replace talk of mental entities with talk of external science. And so, and of course, this move uh, uh, has to prove to be able to account for all the relevant properties that mental entities appear to have. Uh, so, and but the second premise, uh, given the uh, general failure of behaviorism and that talk of science cannot replace mental entities, then we need a uh, cognitivistic cognitive semiotics. And so, um, here I put also a quote um, of the Dezio's interpretation, despite the appearances that Peirce championed an early version of cognitive semiotics, my reading of Peirce is that to the extent that he made use of mentalistic terminology, he did so primarily in order to make his notions understood to contemporaries familiar with that idiom. And he quotes this very famous passage from the early writings of Peirce from his questions concerning certain faculties claimed for men, where Peirce wrote that if we seek the light of external facts, the only cases of thought which, can find, which we can find are of thoughts in science. Plainly, no other thought can be evidenced by external facts, but we have seen that only by external facts can thought be done at all. The only thought then which can possibly be cognized is thought in science, but thought which cannot be cognized does not exist. All thought, therefore, must necessarily be in science. So um, this is not, uh, I don't, this is not how Peirce is being uh, interpreted by everybody. Um, this is why I put also this quote from Helmholtz, because I think that we don't have to read it here, but something like uh, what you can read here is how Peirce was actually uh, interpreted by many, and uh, which is quite the opposite, uh, since um, you, you can see, we can read maybe the beginning insofar as the quality of our sensations gives in, us information about the peculiarities of the exterior process that excites it. It can count as a sign of that, prox of that process, but not as a picture, et cetera, et cetera. So you see um, here, the sign is really the uh, uh, internal, let's say to our body is the internal activation or the 
formation of a sensation and is assigned for the object outside us. And um, so uh, I think the, the, the idea is that if that if first was actually saying something like Helmut's here, then it would not be possible to uh, elaborate on this connection of semiotics with an activism. But let's, so the idea is let's take for granted that Desio's interpretation. And um, of course, let me also uh, add that from the Desio on cognitive semiotics, really in parallel with cognitive sciences followed first the Desio's path and then turned from symbols and propositions to internal representations. So, uh, and admittedly, I'm not pretending to be defending a position the person himself would have defended, which is the job, the job that a persist should do um, following that Umberto Eco's distinction between a persist and a persologue. And I'm just saying that it is, um, so starting from this interpretation of that day's use uh, is, uh, uh, would be an interesting line of research that to, to, to elaborate on you know, the connection between semiotics and then activism that can be investigated from uh, on the grounds of Percy's epistemology. And uh, also, uh, uh, and then the premise will finish, <laughs> that Desio's uh, um, idea and, and consideration of Percy was of course due to the fact that his was one of the first attempts to establish the cognitive semiotics research and standing on the shoulders of first wave classical cognitive science, he con there was this idea at the time and considered everything against uh, a language of thought as uh, anti-mentalistic behaviorism, which of course is an error as we know today, at least. And this is a very recent movement. Uh, here I put this uh, picture of the book edited by Fausto Caruana and Italo Testa called Habits. Um, the idea is that pragmatism can be uh, an heuristic philosophical alliance uh, for uh, an activism, and that the concept of habits, which we can find in pragmatism, obviously, is uh, the, right, the right one to, uh, to find a sort of a third way uh, between dualism on one side and the intelligent uh, unintelligent responses by the by the by the body of organisms, which was behaviorism on the other, and so given that uh, uh, all of you uh, for sure know uh, everything uh, about pragmatism, let's uh, see very quickly what an activism is. Of course, there are many different um, theories of an activism. In general, the idea is that uh, the computer metaphor, um, according to which the mind is like the software, while the brain is like the hardware of a computer, is a wrong metaphor. And that instead, we should look at how real biological organisms uh, act uh, successfully in the wild and so and how they manage to survive in the environment and so um, for an activism and for e-cognitive sciences in general uh, the unit is not more the sandwich model of cognition as susan harley called it uh, which is the metaphor so the the, the model where the mind is the internal software that receives output and give uh, input, I'm sorry, and gives back output, behavioral outputs. But the whole uh, complex uh, system of brain, body, and environment together. Uh, so I already mentioned for cognitive sciences and activism more or less um, um, is committed to all the E's, let's say, and uh, in particular uh, is committed to the, to the thesis that mind is uh, an emergent behavior of an organism attuned to the environment and not the precondition uh, of cognition. And that also the cognition is for action and not for representing or creating an internal model of the world. And uh, Theory meaning guy wise, uh, the idea is that uh, semantics is not in the head, whether they whether propositions or there are no such things as propositions or representation or fragrant senses or uh, anything alike in the head. We just can rely on correla correlations uh, of the body with the outside world. Hence, this stands for anti representationalism, anti functionalism, and anti inferentialism. Of course, I'm not the only one following this line of thought. Here I put some references. As you can see, there are um, semioticians doing this. Uh, I put also 
uh, um, this recent book by Claudio Paolucci and Frederick Sternfeld, uh, Natural Propositions, who are the really, as far as I know, the first people to have pointed out that um, Peirce's epistemology predates the um, extended mind thesis, for example. And but you, as you can see, there are also um, philosophers and cognitive scientists doing just the same. So, and I would like to start before talking about diagrams uh, uh, um, with two of these proposals uh, very quickly. So the first one is Marta Caravas. I, I, I quoted her here in this paper from uh, um, 2019, I'm sorry. And so her idea, so the, you see the problem for an activism is that we have to account for cognition and intelligent cognition and interactions with the environment without uh, representations without internal representations. So here I put also a list. We don't have to read them all. Um, the idea for Marta Carava, who has worked also with Sean Gallagher, for example, is that indexes uh, can do the job. So uh, she proposes to think of action perception as a cognitive task as guided by indexical markers of silence distributed in the environment. And they are co coherent with this uh, with an activism in general, since they are, they are, uh, they have a lot to do with embodiment because, as we all know, indexes are physically connected with their objects, and they are context sensitive and action specific. Um, of course, I agree with uh, everything Marta Carava wrote in this paper. The only problem is that um, uh, this is this cannot be the the whole story. Since uh, indexes, it, it, and it has been said today uh, already, um, there are no such thing as indexes uh, isolated and by themselves, they would not be able to mean uh, anything. So let's see, um, here's another idea from Catherine Legg and her idea is that DC science can do the job. So very quickly, um, okay, uh, internal representationalism is, is really a form of dualism that, uh, nobody uh, buys anymore today. And okay with the life mind continuity thesis, which she takes, she takes it from Ivan Thompson's book from 2007 called Mind in Life. And here I put also cynicism and biosemiotics since uh, mm, basically the, the same thesis is shared by Peirce's theory of cynicism and uh, it is and in the same and, and by biosemiotics in general. So and but the problem is that to define the semantic and get against the behavior is a false dichotomy, as we saw actually uh, already in this presentation. And um, true, uh, especially hard to mine uh, when they criticize uh, um, representations, they often tend to extend the criticism also to semantics. What, uh, however. Uh, could be co co construed uh, and so and um, so and in the formula they, uh, they they want to do a telosemantics without semantics and they call it telosemiotics but without semantics in general that indeed would be a form of behaviorism again so um, so let's go to Peirce and pragmatism replace ideas with habits uh, in this way bridging ontologically mind and body and uh, look for the pragmatic maxim as a, an alternative theory of meaning, which for leg in the cognitive situation has this form. We uh, receive uh, a cue from the environment which elicit uh, a habit. And so for example, when given a certain cue, the agent has been trained has the habit to expect that uh, certain acts will be accompanied by certain experiences. So, and um, um, so, and given so, and here come uh, come the DC science. So, given the important role that uh, habits and symbols in general play in this uh, idea, then leg goes to Peirce's doctrine of DC science and to Frederick Sternfeld's book uh, from 2014. And uh, DC science need no introduction since we have just heard. Uh, the beautiful talk by Sternfeld. And so, of course, there are symbols. They are the only signs, uh, along with arguments, they can say something about something, hence uh, capable of being truth. They have a double structure. And more importantly, for leg, they are coherent with an activism because these signs need not be verbal propositions, as we saw. 
and but also a picture or firefly signals to quote another uh, famous paper by uh, Charbel and Nani, João Queiroz and Frederick Stierfeld. So, and um, Lex's proposal is to do a telosemiotics based on DC science. And so here's uh, her example, a woman waiting to catch a tram. She has the habit of boarding a tram uh, she wishes to catch. Then the tram stops. So it, this is an event that cues her habit to move her legs in a certain schematic way. And uh, uh, as she says, which results in her experiencing a successful boarding. So this is the structure. Uh, we have um, uh, an index and uh, an icon and a symbol, which is the habit linking the two together. And uh, currently with an activism, this is a skill performance, but it, is a, but it simultaneously embodies a person, this is sign, so a proposition structure. And here again, the, the, maybe you already see the problem is that if that we want to account for the woman's ability to interact with their environment. While here, um, she is actually part of the, of the DC sign. So this, this DC sign, this complex DC sign where the train himself is the index and the, the woman moving in a certain way is sort of the, of the predicate and the icon describing. Uh, the train here, uh, but this could can be a DC sign for a third person uh, at most, uh, and but not for herself at first, for, in her first person perspective, and uh, which which is the a third here I wrote a third confusion because at the end if there is time I will show some confu confusion still present in the literature of cognitive science. So I think that both indexes and DC signs are important for co cognition, of course. Uh, indexes, um, while necessary, are not sufficient, though, for cognition, while DC signs are not necessary. Um, notice, however, that from these two proposals, uh, how semiotics can contribute to an activism uh, amounts first and foremost to solving the so-called problem of the terminus aquo of semiosis, as Umberto Eco used to call it, which is the problem of how semiosis starts and how the world can make us start doing inferences or interpretations uh, and et cetera. So, and Umberto Eco's uh, idea was that uh, this problem was solved to the idea of a primary iconism, which I don't have time to go into detail here, but it's pretty famous. And it was, it was of course a revolutionary theory, but also had very problematic as Paulucci and Sternfeld um, pointed out. So according to Paulucci, the, uh, the theory of primary iconism was intuitionistic. And so this is a problem uh, if we want to stay uh, inside a person epistemology and to Sternfeld, uh, Umberto Eco's theory was psychologistic. So of course, I think that both Paulucci and Sternfeld were right. At the same time, I think that Umberto, Eco's, Umberto Eco was actually pointing in the right, in the right direction. The only problem is that his theory was actually not just a theory of primary iconism, but a theory of the primary image. If you recall Peirce's terminology and his trichotomy of icons in, into images, diagrams, and metaphors. Um, so uh, the idea is that instead of, uh, of theorizing about a primary image, which was really Umberto Eco's idea, um, uh, maybe we can go with diagrams and hence suppose we can talk of, of a primary diagrammatism, even if it doesn't sound uh, very well. So, but first, let me also say what we need uh, for an activism. The, there are really two concepts, uh, uh, the, which are the most important for the theory of cognition and the two are interaction. Um, so here I put also definition of what, uh, how the in an activism literature interaction is defined, which is a mutually engaged and co-regulated interaction between at least two autonomous and cognitive agents, where the co-regulation and the interactive behaviors mutually affect each other, such that the interaction process constitutes a self-sustaining organization in the domain of re uh, relational dynamics. And but in, in the interaction, for what uh, concerns perception, uh, this is um, the only thing that is needed is the direct perception, direct perception of affordances without positing no um, simulations in the head or theories uh, or as propositions, which are the two uh, 
uh, major theories in cognitive science for the problem of the, the, the so-called theory of mind problem. And so here put also... Yeah. Uh, I apologize to interrupt, just so we know, we have now entered question time. So it's uh, up to you how, how much time for questions you want to keep or how much you want to continue with your exposition. Just okay. To... Okay, so uh, uh, at most I have 10 minutes, right? Because it was 10 minutes for yes, question. Yes. So, okay, let's skip this part very quickly. We saw that indexes and uh, DC signs are not, um, indexes are, um, are uh, not sufficient while DC signs are not necessary. The idea, the idea is, is really to just to change type of signs and go back to diagrams. And he, so the, the features relevant here is that a diagram has a double structure too, as the DC sign somehow, having a general symbolic part and a perceptual uh, iconic part. The diagrams to pairs are, um, are uh, as Stierfeld told us in, from his book, are a double, actually a double pragmatization of Kant's uh, theory of schematism, since the synthetic a priori is pragmatized, uh, uh, precisely uh, concepts are now uh, just uh, habits mediating and uh, uh, intuitions are uh, iconic and uh, the subjectivism is pragmatized because being external signs and uh, they are publicly manipulable and uh, um, and also they change in the course of, the, of history, of course. So um, basically here, there, now if, um, there are some more um, slides. The idea was just that uh, these the features of the diagrams make, make the, 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 the diagram coherent with an activism and not, not only that, but heuristic. Um, so let me let me see if I can find myself. Heuristic uh, because they are able to um, modelize uh, perception without falling into the so-called, as uh, Sean Gallagher uh, recently confessed, the, pro the problem of um, holistic explanations. So as he said, an activist by focusing on not just the brain, not just the environment, and not just behavior, but on the rich dynamics of brain body environment, offer a holistic conception of cognition and um, to put it succinctly, uh, it is difficult to operationalize holism. What was missing in uh, an activism in general is the level of explanation of habits. And uh, uh, since they play, as, of course, a central role in Peirce's epistemology and in his doctrine of diagrams, then diagram would be a heuristic tool for an activism. Thank you. I think very much to Michele for a very broad presentation. Yeah. Quick one from Michele, please. Uh, yes, please. Okay, okay. Sorry. Okay. Yes, thank you very much. Actually, uh, I, don't, I don't know about others, but I don't understand what you mean with diagrams being publicly uh, manipulable. Manipulable. Diagrams being publicly manipulable. What kind of diagrams is that? Well, um... I couldn't. Uh, I couldn't actually say uh, everything I should have said about diagrams. Um, um, so uh, one of the most important features of diagrams, according to Peirce, is what Sternfeld called the um, operation, uh, operational uh, iconicity criterion. And uh, so, according to this theory, actually every diagram is uh, manipulable and. Uh, uh, when you have uh, um, a proper diagram, meaning uh, that uh, I, I, I tend to call it um, a physical diagram, let's say. So um, really any diagram uh, really that you can have in mind, then you can make experiments, you can uh, elaborate on the diagram. And the, the idea is that through this uh, operational criterion, then you can discover something new 
about the object represented by the diagram that was not uh, immediately uh, perceivable uh, without the, the interaction with the diagram. Okay. Yep. Uh, I see two hands raised. I'm not sure in which order they were raised. Uh, Amelia Lewis, would you like to go ahead and ask your question, please? Uh, yes, thank you. And thank you for the talk. It was fantastic. Um, I was just wondering um, if it's possible to use the term habit and behaviour interchangeably. And I'm thinking because um, in radical behaviourism and in behavioural ecology, um, when studying animal behaviour, it's always spoken about in a very automaton-like way. A behaviour was performed and they just quantify the behaviours. But when you describe the sequence of someone getting on a tram, it almost it was describing the same thing, but it gave the person doing it, the actor, the agent, it gave them control. It was a process that they were involved in. So could you sort of like use habit instead of behavior, for example, in an animal study? Uh, absolutely. So the short answer is that, um, no, um, this is actually, so the radical thesis about an activism that I kind of endorse too, uh, is that, um, uh, for human too, uh, we don't have to talk of mental uh, entities in the head, uh, and we just need, we just need concept of, of habit. But then, of course, the, uh, and the, um, the the heuristicity of this of this move is precisely that in this way you bridge the gap between um, matter and mind. And so, absolutely, absolutely, yes, you you can you can uh, use this concept also for animal. And I think it is something that is uh, done already in the bi biosemiotics literature. And uh, but you also mentioned the the the, the idea of uh, of the possibility to interchange the two terms. So of course, it, it depends on how you define behaviors and habits. Um, um, the whole idea is that um, uh, when Guy Barail uh, from his, his, his book, The Concert of Mind, uh, said, told that, told that, uh, that um, habits are unintelligent responses to the environment, uh, it was, uh, he was wrong, basically, and, or too simplistic, I should say. And uh, uh, even, even the, for example, the Pavlovian experiments, uh, we shouldn't talk of behaviors, but of habits. Of course, if you define behaviors as habits, uh, so uh, as intelligent and adaptive, then you, uh, you end up with the same concept and the problem is solved. Brilliant, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, I would like uh, the next uh, um, question to try to formulate them uh, briefly, please, because there's a couple of students, it will be good to hear as many questions as possible. I know that it's not anywhere, but this is a very complex talk. Uh, please, one thing, please, next. Uh, yes, I was just wondering, uh, what is your position regarding active inference and, and um, Friston's principle of free energy? Do you think that is inactivated or, or, or not? Because it seems to rely on some sort of model or representation. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so you, you probably uh, know that uh, there is this um, important paper that just came out by Randall Beer, Ivan Thompson, and Ezekiel Di Paolo, and they are uh, addressing precisely this, this point and on the differences between um, an activism and the free energy principle. So, uh, of course, uh, from a, uh, um, from the point of view of a person epistemology, inference is uh, important and also for cognition. Um, I think that uh, I'm actually working on this, this, uh, on this problem. I actually think that we can have, um, we can keep, for example, anti the anti-intuitionist uh, principle and inferences without uh, internal representation, but I don't have uh, uh, yet a full story about that. But I think that it is possible. Okay, thank you. Thank you, and I think the last question, Michele, you, uh, now you have to defend yourself against Friedrich Schoenberg. Yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you, Michele. Um, I must thank you, Dave, and uh, I appreciate your idea to use first to uh, bring light 
or the um, in, or uh, in activism. But I would like to ask you about um, opinion about an issue which I think is unresolved in first, maybe his distinction between instinct and reason. You know, his idea is that uh, by far the most uh, beliefs and action. Uh, and the habits we have are really instinctual and in a certain sense too reflective. And then on the other hand, we have reason, which he invariably describes as having something to do with self-control, which to me is disturbing uh, because, you know, the, the general person is very, very with the uh, explanation referring to uh, psychological concepts, certain consciousness. Uh, so here we have a defining reason in terms of conscious self-control. What, 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 what would be your opinion to this? I mean, the distinct reason distinction. So, um, because I couldn't hear very well, uh, I, 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 I heard um, most of it, but actually not the last part. Uh, what are the two the, the two terms of the distinction? Will instinct and reason, in person and instinct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, yeah. So, um, um, so let's see. And um, because I actually uh, wrote something about the about, about this very recently about the theory of rationality and um, but uh, I also uh, read of course um, your paper Frederick about uh, 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 self-controlled habits and uh, so but the, the real question was uh, about the distinction between instinct and self-control and reason reasoning right so I think that uh, uh, um, from a, uh, this, uh, maybe this is how an activism can help uh, semiotics and pragmatism. Um, since, from an, an activist point of view, um, even an instinct would be uh, kind of uh, should be considered as a, as mediated by habits, and so we wouldn't have a stimulus response kind of situation, but still an action mediated by habits, which are probably. Um, uh, habits of the body and all kinds of habits and so uh, then it would be just a matter of degrees from that to um, self-controlled habits mm. i don't know if this answers your question i'm sorry i'm not sure not really <laughs> well thanks very much for this uh... i'm so sorry i couldn't hear very well the question i'm sorry yeah, that's, that's also I think your answer was present. So thank you. Oh, thank you very much. So there we go. As for the not so good quality of the sound, that's our fault. Sorry. Well, uh, thanks very much for an interesting talk, Michael. And uh, I think we had some very interesting uh, discussion overall. Discussion overall, of course. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me.